Welcome to Magnolia United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Brad Chamberlain. This is our service for November 14th, 2021. Today is the 25th Sunday of Pentecost. Next week is the final week in the liturgical year. And yes, this is rather shocking. Advent begins two Sundays from today. In today's service, we'll be focusing on two rather apocalyptic sounding verses. But they're only apocalyptic if we don't know how the story ends. The truth is, we know the good news. We know that good wins. We know that love wins out. We know that Christ is resurrected. Today, we will focus on, on the birth pains of eternity, knowing that the birth pains aren't the end of the story. But beyond the birth pains come new life, new fullness of life for all of creation. Let's join together in this responsive call to worship. Not one stone will be left on stone. We worship our rock and our salvation. Beware that no one leads you astray. We worship our source of wisdom and truth. What all seems lost this is just the beginning of the birth pangs. We are here to worship the word that endures and the hope that is born among us. Today's gospel reading is from Mark 13, 1 through 8. As Jesus was leaving the temple that day, one of his disciples said, Teacher, look at these magnificent buildings. Look at the impressive stones in the walls. Jesus replied, Yes. Look at these great buildings, but they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Later, he sat on the Mount of Olives across the valley from the temple. Peter, James, John, and Andrew came to him privately and asked, Tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will show us that these things are about to be fulfilled? Jesus replied, Don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars. But don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in many parts of the world, as well as famines. But this is only the first of the birth pains, with more to come. Today's prayer of confession is from the United Methodist Church's hymnal, number 893. Lord, we confess our day-to-day -day failure to be truly human. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we confess that we often fail to love with all that we have and are, often because we do not fully understand what loving means, often because we are afraid of risking ourselves. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we cut ourselves off from each other and we erect barriers of division. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we confess that by silence and ill-considered word, we have built up walls of prejudice. Lord, we confess that by selfishness and lack of sympathy, we have stifled generosity and left little time for others. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Help us listen to your word of forgiveness, for we are very deaf. Come, fill this moment, and free us from sin. Offerings may be given by check sent to the address shown, or online at umcmagnolia.com. Just go to the Give link. Let's pray for this week's offering. Mighty God, architect of the universe, your work of creation and building is always before us. We give our gifts this day in hopes that we might be builders with you in the creation of your kingdom here on earth. May our gifts also reach others who are hurting, who feel disconnected from your love, that they too may join us in the stonework of kingdom building, whose mortar is the sharing of Christ's love with the world. In Christ our Savior and Redeemer we pray. Amen. Our next reading today is Psalm 46. 
God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos, and their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders, and the earth melts. The Lord is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Come see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord Almighty is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. For most of us, there's a few places in our house that get out of control. Um, certainly, maybe like a junk drawer or two. We have one, uh, one junk drawer that's sort of a miscellaneous kitchen stuff junk drawer. And another one, also in the kitchen, that's full of pencils and tape and dead batteries and some coins and rubber bands and a box of toothpicks which got flipped upside down and spilled everywhere. And then there's our Tupperware drawer. Filled with a jumble of mismatched lids and canisters. And there's the pots and pans where the good pans go and disappear while the junky ones seem to scooch up to the front row. Which they share with a bunch of lids that don't seem to match any of the pots. Oh, and that kitchen junk drawer, the kitchen stuff junk drawer I talked about, by the way. You can't even open it anymore because I think the meat thermometer got turned sideways. And when I pulled on the drawer too hard, the pointy metal bit dug into the bottom of the next drawer up. And now the two drawers open in tandem, rendering the lower drawer, the junk drawer, useless. And that is today's sermon. No. Okay. So the day comes along where the pain of that messed up drawer is just not worth the convenience of dealing with it anymore. There's a bit of leftover bacon, and there's just no way you're going to find anything to put it in. So you end up just scraping the bacon, that valuable, expensive bacon, into the compost bin, even though you would have liked to have those last two pieces waiting for you tomorrow. So, all right, it's time to deal with it. And you find yourself in the kitchen with a stack of 50 containers and 62 lids, trying to match them up. You've got them spread across the floor and all the counters. And God forbid anyone else wants to try and use the kitchen for the next hour because your project has taken over. Everything is a mess now that you started dealing with it. At the moment, it's way worse than if you just left the jumble in the drawer. But now that you've gotten them all out, you start to organize them. And as they get organized, and you do find maybe 10 or so actual matching lid and container sets, you can reload the drawer in an orderly fashion and ah, all better. Leftovers from tomorrow's dinner will just take seconds and zero frustration to put away. We have made it through the Tupperware drawer desert to the promised land. And that's just the Tupperware drawer. The junk drawers, the car trunk, the garage or the attic, those are some big jobs. And once you start, things are going to be ugly for quite a while before it's going to be able to be restored and everything will be put into its proper place. This is how I feel about dealing with inner pain, with inner brokenness. There are messes in our lives, in our hearts, in our actions, in our memories, in our relationships. And dealing with those messes is a pretty big and scary commitment. Things are probably going to get a lot uglier before they're going to get any better. And so, rather than deal with it, we try to find some sort of point of stasis 
where we just learn to live with the unforgiveness. We live with the inner pain, the broken relationships, because dealing with it would be so hard. And it almost feels like if I just don't open the drunk junk drawer, those problems don't exist. And so we live a muted life filled with the constant background noise of that which we are avoiding. But those hidden inner wounds, they're still there. Those avoided relational wounds, they're still there. They affect your ex acceptance of yourself. They affect your relationships with others. They affect your relationship with God. You are constantly on guard, unable to be your true self, unable to act authentically, unable to experience the joys and the sorrows, which brings so much color into our lives, unable to thrive or to flourish as God has intended for us all. And on up it goes from the insignificance of the junk drawer to our own inner brokenness, to our broken relationships, and out to our community, our society, and to all of God's creation. Like fractals, this pattern repeats throughout all of existence. We are nearing the end of the church calendar year. In fact, this is our second to last week. Next week is the final Sunday of Pentecost, which began way back in May, when we started our in-person services, in fact. And when we get to Advent, on the last Sunday of this month, we will be at the start of the new liturgical year, focusing once again on a broken, dark world in need of a Savior. And the four weeks of darkness of Advent are followed by the joyful season of Christmas to mark the coming of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, the coming of light and hope and wholeness coming into the broken world. <coughs> Sorry. Last week, we looked at our inner wretch, our inner brokenness, including our need for repentance, our need for receiving God's forgiveness, and then for accepting that forgiveness, all is essential for us to be made whole and to be able to thrive and flourish as God's beloved children. Fullness of life only comes through acknowledging the brokenness and seeking God's healing even when that's painful. We can get through this only because we know that God is with us. We are held in God's hand. We are in the shadow of her wings and that God is faithful. We can be steady through the struggle because we are held by God. We can be loved to others in the midst of struggle because we know we are loved by God. We can humble ourselves to accept help from others because we know that God is in the hands, feet, words, and faces of each person we meet. We are provided for. It's going to be okay. Everything's going to be all right. We can claim this truth right now. This week, our verses expand this whole idea out even further. And they have us not just looking at our individual inner brokenness, but looking at the brokenness of the entirety of humanity and our impact on breaking many other parts of God's creation as well. And so, these apocalyptic visions in our gospel reading and psalm reading offer us a glimpse that the same cycle is underway in all of creation. These are not end-time issues. These are birth pains at the beginning of an eternity of wonder and fullness of life. When we start to deal with the brokenness in our lives, it is messy, difficult, scary, ugly. Jesus, in today's gospel verse, verses, is describing the birth pains of God's eternal community being fully present on earth as also requiring this messy, ugly, painful process. But just as with our own reconciliation to God, we fix our sights on God and God's view of us and on God's faithfulness. We are to put our trust in God and not in ourselves. And just as we can now weather the storm of going through the 12 steps or apologizing to our spouse or asking for forgiveness from our children or having that long overdue painful heart to heart with our parents, we also know that we can weather the sorrows in the world around us. 
we can engage with love here and now, knowing that God is in charge, not us. Today's two Bible readings take the same idea and apply it to the next level up. What does it take for all of humanity to thrive? What does it take for all of God's creation to thrive? These verses, they do feel apocalyptic, but they're significant, signif sorry, they're signifying movement through the desert to the promised land, through the pain of peacemaking into peace, through the struggle of therapy into wholeness, through <laughs> the struggle of pain to gains, through forest fire to new growth. In our verse from Mark today, we find the disciples and Jesus leaving the temple, and one of the disciples is just stoked and amped up and expresses how impressed he is by the stones and the building quality of the temple. And Jesus responds in kind of a hilarious, curmudgeonly way, saying, Yeah, look at these buildings. They're pretty cool, but they're going to be destroyed. Not one stone will be left on top of another. And then he goes on, not just will the temple be destroyed, but there will be wars of nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes and there will be famines. But, he says, this is just the birth pains. And I guess I've often read this verse and felt like it is pretty horrific and depressing. I think I've interpreted this as meaning that all this destruction is just the start of even more destruction, the end times. As if saying these are just the birth pains means that we'll start out with all this misery, but it will just keep on getting worse. But that is really, truly not the gospel. That would not be... Well, actually, what that would be is sort of the opposite of good news. And that's just not how birth pains work. Birth pains are a horrible pain which has to be traversed to get to the miracle of life. Jesus is saying that all of these horrors are coming, but they are ushering in not more pain and sorrow and death, but they are ushering in fullness of life on a universal scale. So now we turn to Psalm 46. There's all this destruction on its way. Earthquakes, mountains crumbling into the sea, oceans roaring and foaming, mountains trembling as the waters surge, nations in chaos, kingdoms crumbling, thunder from the heavens, and even the earth melting. In verse 8 we read, Come, see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. <laughs> glorious works. These seem like horrific works. But what's being destroyed? Verse 9 is what finally gets us clear. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. What is God destroying? God is destroying our war infrastructure. God is destroying our nationalism, our prejudices, our egos and pride and selfishness. God is destroying the systems which divide his people. These are the horrors which must be destroyed. But we are so hooked on this, so invested in societal and technological ways to divide and destroy, that wiping all of that out is indeed very costly to contemplate. The fallout could be horrific, the earth melting. But what the psalmist is saying and what Jesus is saying in Mark is that like the temple, these human-made, ego-serving mechanisms of division and destruction will themselves be destroyed, even as our selfishness, pride, and loyalty only to self-preservation and security is destroyed in each of our lives. Last week we looked at repentance and learned about accepting and even loving ourselves through accepting God's forgiveness and thereby letting go of our selfish focus and gaining the ability to truly love others and to truly live out our love of God through loving others. This is the individual level. 
now in the Psalms and in Jesus' words in Mark, we are talking about that same process on a global scale. What is being judged? This isn't a she's right and he's wrong kind of situation. It isn't a you're in but you're out kind of story. This is a judgment of all that we create and all that we do which serves to divide and destroy community. And this destruction is a necessary part of healing and reconciliation, of right relationship between God's created and our Creator. These verses aren't ultimately about destruction. These are verses about renewal and healing. These are verses of redemption. We are not thrown about by the waves of good days and bad days, social change, the rise and fall of empires even. These all matter in the moment, but we have our eyes fixed on God. In verse 1 of Psalm 46, we read, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when the earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. We trust in God's faithfulness. We care deeply for all that is around us. Like the Israelites in the desert, we look to the promised land, but we are also called to thrive and flourish when we're in the desert. We are called to contentment and gratitude and fullness of life right now, serving eternity regardless of the glories or horrors of the moment. In verse 10 of this psalm, we are shown our role. Be still and know that I am God. And then verse 11, the Lord Almighty is here among us, thriving, flourishing, living our lives as God intends for us, involves being fully engaged in the world around us, but not thrashed about by it. We are rooted in Christ. We are branches connected to the vine. We are held in the palm of his hand, and we hold to the promise from God that good will win out that God is over everything, and that the current and impending struggles and upheavals are but birth pains, ushering in fullness of life. So there's this principle at work in the Tupperware drawer, in my heart, in my relationships, in our community, in the world, across creation. And that same principle is at work in an even more significant narrative. Christ himself having to face death on the cross as the ultimate modeling of this principle of regeneration. Christ dying on the cross is not the ushering in of future horrors. It is the ushering in of fullness of life. It is the ushering in of thriving communion between us and God and one another. The horrors of the crucifixion are the birth pains of eternity. We know how the crucifixion turned out. It led to the resurrected Christ, the defeat of death, the victory has been won. If we can claim this reality, that God is in charge and God's covenant is true at this ultimate level, at the level of God reconciling with us humans, we can claim God's faithfulness in our world, in our community, in our friendships, and in our own lives. And we can thrive as we fully engage through love in the world around us, whatever the circumstances. Jesus, in our passage from Mark, is speaking of a time when we collectively, though through a painful process, will be cleared of these destructive, divisive elements of war and hate and prejudice. The cancer will be cut out of humanity and out of the junk we've created, such that peace health, and wholeness can reign in us and in everyone and across creation. And this is what we set our hope in. This enables us right now to live life in that future hope, to live life in fullness, to flourish, regardless of the circumstances of our times or the worries and struggles in our lives. God's word is true. The victory is won. We can live to the fullest now. And so next week is Thanksgiving week. And we can take some time in this coming week to be thankful, to express our gratitude to a God who is steadfast 
and faithful and trustworthy. In this week ahead, I want us to focus on gratitude, on thankfulness, in the good stuff and in the hard. Let's try to step back to an eternal perspective when confronted. Let's be thankful not just for the births and joys, but also for the birth pains and the struggles. And if you are willing, grab a few moments of gratitude from the coming week and be prepared to share them in our service next week as we usher in Thanksgiving and then as we enter into the season of Advent and then the miracle of God with us this Christmas season. This story, the story of your life and the story of this entire universe is one where good wins. Your story and the story of the entire universe is ultimately a story where love wins. And this is the gospel. This is indeed good news. Let's pray together as Jesus taught his disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Receive today's benediction. May all of your expectations be frustrated. May your plans be thwarted. May all of your desires be withered into nothingness, that you may experience the powerlessness and poverty of a child and sing, dance, and trust in the love of God, the three in one, Creator, Christ, and Divine Spirit. Amen. Okay. See you next week. Bye.